Greetings, Church, and welcome to this service of the First Baptist Church in America on this first Sunday in August. Thank you for joining us for this service of meditation and song. While work continues at the Meeting House, we continue to hold our services online and on the first Sunday of the month on the back garden at the Meeting House. We hope that some of you will be joining us today at 11 a.m. There is plenty of sunshine and shade. Feel free to bring a blanket to sit on or some chairs if you'd like. We appreciate your continuing to send in your prayer request. This helps us to best know how to hold you in prayer. We thank you for your ongoing support through your prayers and through your offerings. This makes a difference. If you want more information about our church, you can go to fbcia.org. As is our custom, on the first Sunday of the month, we share in the Lord's Supper. So if you need to take a moment now and gather the elements that you will need for that portion of our service, feel free to do so now. During these summer months, we are continuing our conversation on soul liberty and religious freedom. This morning, we are blessed by a word brought to us by Douglas Aviles Bernal, who is the executive minister of the Evergreen Association of American Baptist Churches, primarily situated in the Northwest Pacific region. He grew up as an MK, that's a missionary kid, and is a lifelong Baptist, passionate about what it means to be a part of this broader family. He has led conferences for missionary children, and on topics of diversity and equity and justice, which has been a passion of his for over 20 years. Join together with me in a word of prayer. Our God, we thank you for this day and for your people. We pray that we would recognize and use and not take for granted the gifts and the graces that you have blessed us with. Help us to use these gifts wisely and in ways that reflect you and that benefit all your people. Make us fit to be your body. Heal us in our wounded places. Comfort us in our grief. Bolster us where we are timid. Give us humility where we require it. Give us humble and generous spirits. Help us learn to use our gifts for the benefit of your whole body, knowing that we are one in you with all the saints who live now and those who've gone before. We pray now in the manner Jesus taught us, saying, Blessed one, our father and our mother, holy is your name. May your love be enacted in all the world. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive those indebted to us. Spare us in the time of trial. Deliver us from evil. For all that we do in your love and all that your love brings into being and the fullness of love that will be are yours now and forever. Amen. Join me at the table. Jesus often sat with his friends enjoying a meal, a fellowship. At these tables, strangers were made into friends. Water turned to wine, sorrow into joy. The requirement of pulling up a chair at this table is that you hunger and you thirst after God and God's way in the world. Come and fill your hungry places with the fullness that God promises to each of us. Pray with me. We thank you, God, for farmers and sunshine, for those who share in this meal with us. Bless it so that we may be strengthened to be your body in the world. Amen. On the night when he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread. And after blessing it, he broke it and said, this is my body, broken for you. As often as you eat this, do so and remember me. Take and eat this bread of life.
In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup and said, This is the new covenant poured out in me. As often as you drink this, do so in remember me. Take and drink this cup of heaven. Friends, you can share this meal by making sure the hungry are fed in your community. Make donations to Better Live Rhode Island here locally or wherever you live so that we can continue to feed the world in God's way. What a blessing it is to be with you today on this wonderful Sunday to chat a little bit about something very important to us Baptist. It is indeed an honor to be with you. Greetings to you all, to your pastor and everyone. A blessing and a joy for me. May we begin with a word of prayer, please. Precious God, may we hear your voice to speaking to us today. May we be blessed by it. May we be guided. May we be nudged. Please, Lord. Allow us to hear what you have for us today, in spite of who is bringing it to us. Amen. Soul freedom. It is really an honor to, to, to chat with you a little bit about it, something that is so powerful, so misused, uh, and such a world-changing concept. Uh, you know, this, this has been as the, at the root of who we are as Baptists, uh, our entire history. Uh, and of course, it is repleted, is pregnant with endless possibilities of where it could go, where it has been, and how it could help us. Now, of course, because of our time limitations, I will restrict our conversation to our current moment in history in our country. Clearly, this concept appeals to our Americanness in profound and intuitive ways. Um, I do what I want. I'm my own boss. Nobody tells me what to do. I am the center of, uni of the universe. It is you and me, Jesus. The two of us will do it. And on and on. It, it, <clears throat> it informs and it encourages the best and the worst of our Americanness. And of course, I think all of this boils down to be one of the greatest gifts we humans have been given for the good of us all and for our selfishness. Uh, because we have a long, long history of soul freedom being used to manipulate, to control, to enrich ourselves and so, so, so much more. You know that they often, the Lord told me. And, and I think it's very much as, as the philosopher Schopenhauer said uh, on his essays on pessimism. He said, every man takes the limits of his own field of vision for the limits of the world. And very much that's how we are tempted to use soul freedom. As far as I could see, as far as I could understand, that's what it means. Still. The concept of soul freedom is so powerful that it can transform individuals and societies, certainly for the better, in so very many ways, as long as it is lived under the full light of the gospel. Because I think that at the heart of the issue is the fact that soul freedom under the gospel means that the individual is invaluable, unique, and of the most importance to the community. And we can find this in, in, in I love how 1 Corinthians 12 gives us an outline of this. And I like to read a big chunk of it because I think, I think it says, what I'd like to say much better than I could. First Corinthians 12, beginning on verse 14. 
Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot would say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. And if the ear would say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it, but as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as God chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the hand to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And those members of the body that we think less honorable, we clothe with greater honor and our less respectable members are treated with greater respect, whereas our more respectable members do not need this. But God has so arranged the body, given, given the greater honor to the inferior members, that there may be no dissension within the body. But the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. <clears throat> in other words, and that's First Corinthians, in other words, you are free to choose as you please. You matter. You are unique in essential ways. You are completely different than any other part of the body. But if you make your choices without thinking about the body to which you belong, you will hurt yourself and the body. It's very much as the public policy expert Heather McGee tells us in her TED talk, racism has a cost, right? Whatever you do in ignorance or in disregard or against the body will not only hurt the body, but hurt yourself too. This is where she speaks of, of when, during the civil rights movement, when desegregation came and towns all over the United States uh, closed their swimming pools, they closed their summer camping programs, they, they closed their parks and recreation sections, all just so that they would not have to desegregate those spaces. In other words, they deeply hurt themselves and especially their children just so they could continue to hurt those they thought they should be hurting. Whereas scripture, the gospel tells us that we must be individuals who live in community, each remaining different from each other because those differences are what help the body function as it should. We work because we're different. We function because we're different. Now, of course, this concept is so difficult to our imperfect humanity that we have never been able to handle it well. This is why we Baptists were so radical in the beginning when we were called nonconformists, then we were exiled, then even murdered. This is when John Smythe and Helwin and the rest of the early nonconformists were, were exiled. They were tortured. Many died in jail. They couldn't, they had to create new cemeteries just so that they could be buried. All of this boiled down to them discovering, rediscovering, highlighting, exposing soul freedom. Our Baptist family was born in a world where individuals did not see themselves apart from the role into which they were born. Which in essence means that, 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 that people assumed that, that political stability required religious uniformity. Worse still, they thought that social cohesion 
was impossible without religious cohesion. That was the world into which the nonconformists introduced, well, reintroduced the ancient yet yet seemingly new concept. I, I, I really very much think that our contribution as Baptists to, to the life of faith in this world includes at its core the distinctive that God values us each as individuals. And at the same time, we must fully embrace the depth and love God has for the uniqueness of our individu individuality that must be lived in the beautiful freedom within the certainty that God created the individual for the benefit of the community. And, and, and I think that the beauty of this is, is, is mind-boggling, right? We, we are precious, unique, designed, special. We have got to remain all of that for the sake of community. Cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am, must live together, embedded, webbed with Ubuntu. I am because we are. So what now? Where does that leave us as Baptists in our current world of division, in our current world where the boundaries have been set, in our current world where people tend to describe themselves not by who they are, but the party to which they belong. Fully certain that you would know what that means. Well, life with individual versus communal tension is not easy. And we have often been lured by the comfort and certainty and, and, and clarity of homogeneity. The largest group among us, our, our, our Southern Baptist friends, have been on a steady trajectory to becoming exactly what we sought to avoid early on in our country. The majority of our Baptist brethren, and, and it is the men leading this, clearly state the puritanical colonial outlook that political stability requires religious uniformity. Worse still, that social, societal cohesion is impossible without religious, religious homogeneity. At the same time, I think it leaves us who are struggling with this paradox in a healthy way exactly where Baptists have been when we have been closest to the gospel. I think this leaves us in the dangerous middle, shouting that we will not, we could not support any form of religious being married to temporal government regardless of the truth that both must exist. This leaves us saying that soul freedom is essential for profound and selfless community and most importantly that all must be free to and from religious life. Of course, Soul freedom needs context. It must exist in relation to and in response and engagement with the current context in which it is living. This is why in our current world, soul freedom for us Baptists needs to mean life in the dangerous middle. Soul freedom, freedom as we understand it, must sit in the middle between the anarchist individualists who feel everyone should be free to do whatever they want, wherever they are, whenever they are, and the temporal dictators who want to force their worldview into everybody. We, as Baptists, must come back to where we have always been. We need to live in the dangerous middle. This is the space we nonconformists have occupied most thoroughly every season. We seem to have been in the most trouble. And isn't it how it always is? The closer you are to the gospel, the more 
trouble you get into in the world in which you live. We were in the dangerous middle at the birth of our country when the best thing to do was to create one's own colony, one's own space like the Puritans did in New England or like the Catholics did in Mary Land. We instead argued for a Bill of Rights that called for the Mohammedans, for the atheists, and even for Baptists to worship as they felt led, wherever they may be. This led through the push organization of, of, of the Reverend Leland into our religious liberties being included in our Bill of Rights. Or maybe a dangerous middle, for example, was in the 1920s during the convention of the Northern Baptists, a group of Baptists skillfully organized a significant number to demand that Northern Baptists go back to scriptural principles and other phrases used to inform, to enforce homogeneity of thought and actions. Their efforts were so effective that many, many thought that there was no choice but to split up again. Fortunately for us, and I'd say because of the spirit, Helen Montgomery Barrett was our president, was our convention president, and she firmly settled, sat, and spoke in the dangerous middle. And not only did she lead us away from schism, Baptists left that convention excited and inspired by the God-given strength of the diversity among them. She worked the back rooms on both sides. She loved, she pushed, I'm sure she pulled, I'm sure she twisted some arms. And then beautifully and powerfully, she brought it together in, in her sermon to the whole convention gathered there. At the end of which, we were one, though we were different. She used a phrase during this convention and she even had it printed and posted against uh, on top of the big main stage. And I think this phrase uh, says what I've been trying to say in very few words and much more powerfully. She said, agreed to differ, but resolved to love. She chose the dangerous middle and just about single-handedly kept our Baptist movement together. Other dangerous middles we have inhabited was, for example, in the suffragist movement, or work with, our, with natives in our country, or work with Asian communities during the enslavement for the railroads and during the, during the internment camps that we had during World War II for, for our Asian uh, Japanese family from the West Coast. Uh, in the work of the Philadelphia docks where immigrants who didn't even speak English were loved by our Baptist family. We were active participants in the civil rights movement of the 1960s where sitting in the middle was the worst thing you could do. You had to be one or the other. You had to love some and hate the other. In that time, we joined the movement, a movement we had at its core I am a man. That was a fundamental component. And that statement clearly pointed to the individual, but at the same time pointed to recognizing that the importance and the importance and intrinsic value of the individual is fundamental to a healthy community. We are all members of one body. None can tell the other, I do not need you. None can think they are the most important, nor could any of our body live if we were all the same. So what does soul freedom mean? Our convention president long ago, Helen Montgomery Barrett, stated it best. Soul freedom is agreed to differ, but resolved to love, just as scripture and Jesus clearly taught us. Amen.